It's never easy to be the first speaker of the day because it's really early up, that's why I have my coffee up. And I also start off with a little bit to say that, to be honest, um, not 100% prepared uh, for the occasions. Uh, and this lights means a couple of things to me on a different levels. One is uh, today's occasion. Second thing is also express how I felt when I transit from a designer to a design uh, leader. And it's never easy to transit from a designer to a uh, design leader. On the third level, it's also expressions that I like to um, describe how the UX uh, industry is uh, based, on the, based on what I've observed in the last uh, 10 years when UX got a lot of um, attention and demand and where we actually do have about a talent crunch back five to six years ago. We still have it, but it was quite acute. Uh, talent crunch uh, back five to six years uh, ago for experienced U.S. Uh, professionals. So in a way, the U.S. industry is not ready, neither is the talent crunch uh, ready um, for it. And to be honest, are we actually ready now, right? Some of the key questions that I do like everyone to think a little bit about is, what is U.S. now? And what does uh, U.S. stand for in your organization? Right, so this is a weird slide, to be honest. <laughs> to show uh, publicly. Uh, the reason that I'm showing is because I wanted to demonstrate and show that I have been in your shoes. I worked as a designer uh, in creative agencies for four years before moving in-house in creative uh, technology where I started out as a UI designer. Eventually, I moved to the UX um, role and working on digital product and experiences, right? So what I realized, I find myself have been moving uh, back and forth between a tech company to a corporations or enterprise, and from an enterprise back to a tech, and now I'm back to an enterprise uh, again. And while moving, while moving between companies, I was very lucky to be exposed uh, to working with various uh, business functions uh, due to the projects that I've been working on. And I was exposed to how different companies work, their culture, the kind of leadership styles, um, the kind of uh, mindset. And from there, I observed that it actually does have an impact on how we design products and <clears throat> deliver uh, products, right? So if I may ask, right, if you have to describe the kind of work that you do, how would you actually describe them? Very often we will see this. Right? Very often we'll see that, hey, someone may say, hey, I'm running a design thinking workshops with all the post-six nooks uh, on the wall. I'm doing customer journey mapping. I'm running a design critic sessions. And to be honest, um, these are the things that really doesn't matter when you're actually producing. These are the things that doesn't matter and doesn't really contribute ultimately to a great product and the experiences, right? And these things alone will not move design forward in your organization, right? So basically, today's talk is very simple. It's talking about my own observation, my learnings uh, that I've uh, observed uh, along uh, the way to share with everyone today. So. Before we start, I like, usually I like to take a step back. One thing that I learned from retrospective um, is that sometimes taking a step back is the quickest way to move forward. The more we know about uh, US its origins, the factors and the forces that have helped to shape it, the better we are in navigating the future. So how did US come in in the first place, right? So some might say US is a modern field. To be honest, U.S. is almost about a century old. It started out in the late 19th century during the industrial and machines uh, age where we start to see big factories. Like big factories, they start building big complex products where thousands of components are being assembled to make a product. Industrial designers then started looking into how can they make, how can humans work more efficiently in order to produce a product and how can they retinize work and most of the work then was, written, uh, was spearheaded by Henry Ford and the mechanical uh, engineer named Frederick uh, Taylor. And as we move forward into World War II, right? World War II, we saw the emerging fields of uh, human factors and ergonomics. One of the reasons why is because during the war time, human was put into a stressful and dangerous situation where small little errors can be fatal. And human factors design was applied in the design of equipment and devices so that it can be best aligned with human capabilities, right? Some of you might ask exactly what is uh, human factors design. If I quote, right, human factors uh, designs basically is a scientific discipline concerned with the understanding of interactions among humans and other elements of a system. 
and the profession that applies theory, principles, data, methods to design and optimize well-being and overall systems. And in terms of the framework, it looks at human being in the center of everything. You have, you have machine, hardware, software that the human uses. You have the operation and anim, uh, management like policies that the human is being subjected to. And you have the environment and the context that the human or the user is being subjected to. For example, is it indoor? Is it outdoor? Is he sitting down? Etc. And if you think about it, it sounds a lot like UX that we know today, or at least what we are being uh, took to. All right, and moving forward a little bit into the 70s, we saw the emerging disciplines of computer engineering, uh, uh, cognitive uh, science, merging together with uh, human factors, right? And many of the early innovations happens here in Xerox uh, Research Center, such as the graphical user interface that we have been probably taken for granted, and also the inventions uh, of mouse, right? And one of the biggest contributions that designs has made in terms of computer engineering is the design of a graphical interface where it helps to merge and make computer more accessible to the general public because it used to be something that is a niche skills to a small group of users. So this is one of the biggest contributions that design has made. And we move a little bit uh, forward to the 1990s. 1990s, we also start to see the emergence of uh, World Wide Web Internet. And Don Norman, this guy here, Right, it's coined the term UX, and many of us refer to Don Norman as the father of UX. And we take a look at how Don Norman uh, termed UX as. Right, he called it that he invented the term right, because I thought human interface and usability were too narrow, and he wanted to cover all aspects of the person's experience with a system, including industrial designs, graphics, the interface, the physical interactions, and the manual. Again, it sounds really similar to human factors design. And we progressed to nearer to 10 years ago, 2009. One of the key innovations that we saw in human history is the inventions or uh, the delivery of iPhones. We saw uh, iPhone was two years old. There's Android as well, and um, the emergence of our app stores, right? And bearing in mind, during this time, 2009, Google was only seven years old. And how does the world look like 10 years ago? Right. Mm. OK. OK. So back in 2009, the world population stands at 6.85 billion. All right. And the smartphone penetration rate is 26 million. So it's a small subset of the entire total world population. And during 10 years ago, most of the smartphone use cases were for business users, even though we start to see an increase of uh, consumers buying smartphones. And there is a strong competition in um, mobile phones handsets uh, makers to win the war for mobile phones. And back then, 10 years ago, I was working in creative technology. For those who are not aware, creative tech actually is Singapore's first tech startup. And during its prime days, it was listed on NASDAQ. Uh, it's famous for its audio products, and it actually is the inventor of MP3 uh, technology, right? And the, race, the rise of Apple products created a push for product design uh, investment. And during those days, when you say product design, it actually means industrial design, right? And back 10 years ago, there is a awareness of user-centered design. However, it was very much still under-invested. Uh, and designers, uh, design uh, in general, are still very much push, uh, pushing uh, pixels. And like most tech firms of that time, Creative was very much founded uh, by engineers. And mo most of the engineering, most of the major decisions were actually made by engineers. And this is uh, most uh, clearly vocalized uh, by the vocal exit of Google owns uh, lead, visual design lead, where he made a statement, right? He wrote about his own frustrations uh, on his own blog, working as a designer, working in an engineering-focused company. It created quite a lot of commotion in our uh, industry, in our community then, because he pointed out Google's culture where every single design decision has to be proven by data, right? He talks about when he needs to prove himself with data, how, why he made decision of using three pixel, four pixel, or five pixels uh, border, right? So 
that was also one of the most famous during then, uh, I would call it a famous example where Google's team couldn't decide two shades of blue. What the Google team does is he went, they went on to test 41 shades of blue in order to decide which shades of blue to use. And if you're like me, who came from an art school, right, the concept of designing by data was actually unheard of during that time. Right? And design, same thing, designers are very much used to designing by idea, design, designing by how we feel. So the fact that design decisions needs to be rationalized by science actually made a lot of us uh, uncomfortable. And this is quite natural during that time because in the tech world then, the field, even the, the um, design field was dominated by engineers trained in human factors, human computer uh, interface design, and very common design was a support functions of engineering in a tech firm. All right, so the idea of still designing with data, designing around customers was not common despite its gaining a bit of attraction back 10 years ago. And we fast forward uh, today, right? Where is the population stance uh, now? Just make sure I get, right, make sure I get that up. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the current population stands at 7.7 billion, slightly increased a little bit. And where does the mobile phone's uh, ownership stands? 5 billion. Oops, just give me a minute. Right, so it's actually, it's a staggering growth. And the same things for App Store. It started out with only 500 apps in 2008, and it risen to 3.9 million last year. And the total apps downloads reported by App Annie is 194 billion downloads. So in a way, what does it mean for the industry uh, as a whole? Right? It means that there is a sharp demand for designers, for developers across the world. And if you look at the data, since 2004, more than 100 design-related companies has been acquired, and 60% of them has only been required recently about three years ago, right? And major consulting firms like IBM, Accenture, Deloitte, McKinsey, alone spend 1.2 million on acquiring design agency. Never have we seen so much money investment pour into a small segment of the design industry. And this money has been spent on acquiring creative agency to do US. And we also start to see designer being hired to work in telecommunications, banking, accounting, and business consulting firms, right? And what has happened, if we think about it on a larger scale, right? What has happened is we see an exploration of design firms from creative agencies to UX firm acquired to do UX design. And to be honest, if I look at the challenges that we have 10 years ago, it's pretty much very little difference from what we are facing today because designers still have a very narrow view of UX. And we think, if we think about it, from what we learned about history, right, that US actually covers a wider intent and the bigger universe that it has always been meant to be, right? It covers designing for human, designing for people. It covers system thinking and mind. It requires multidisciplinary subject knowledge expertise in order to deliver a product from engineering to cognitive science, right, to design itself and business uh, input in order to deliver uh, great uh, products. And, what, <clears throat> and if that's the case, where do we go from here? And where does UX stand now? And if you are a designer or you are a design leader, what's your plan? Do you have a plan if you work in an enterprise? What is your view of UX? How do you want to build your team? All right. If you're new to leadership role, the first question is, are you ready for the leadership role? Because the role definition and responsibility can differ from company to company, culture to culture, depending on the size. Leading a two-person team, designers, is very different from leading a team of 20, a team of 30 and above. Right? So, Recently, this year, Envisions reported that the average number of designers in the enterprise stands at 27. So the likelihood of some of you going to lead a sizable team is actually very high. And when I, ref when I reflected it about, uh, on myself, I find myself unprepared 
for the design leadership role because I have very little idea of what it means to be a design lead, right? Does it mean saying yes to everyone? Or does it mean ensuring that my team feels good? Or does it mean I delegate every single thing to my team while I spend time working on strategy, design strategy, whatever that means, right? So one thing to help those of you who are moving forward into a design lead role, think about your things that you do daily as a designer versus a design leader, right? So if I ask a designer what it does every day, usually it will cover one of this. I'm working on my sketch, I'm working on wireframes, I'm doing prototyping, I'm going to run a user research test tomorrow or usability test tomorrow, I have a workshops to run, etc. right? Versus someone who is a design leader in a leadership role. It's true, <laughs> this is how I spend my days. <laughs> And once in a while, present, present the deck or two. Um, that's the to be honest, that's the reality, guys. That's the reality when you move to become a design leader in a corporation, in an enterprise. That is what's happening. It is exaggerated, you guys love. It is exaggerated, to be honest, to a certain uh, extent, but it's actually not far away from the truth, right? The transition from a designer to a leadership role can be very hard. Uh, for, for you and for me as well, for some of us. <clears throat> because most of us are in this line for the love of craft, right? The passions run deep. We enjoy doing things, right? We enjoy designing things. We enjoy looking at beautiful things. I'm included uh, as well, right? But as a, as, as, a, as, a lead, as a leader, you're probably going to spend very little time doing all this, right? You're going to spend very little time in designing. You're going to spend a lot more time managing the team. And because the work of design rests on the others. And this is probably one of the most difficult things about the transition from a designer to a leadership role. And what do you do? I don't know about you guys. That's the first thing that I went to. I read books. I bought a lot of books. Right? I read a lot. Um, but to be honest, I also think that there is a limit into how much books can help you. Because end of the day, leadership Change management is something definitely that one learn best by doing, right? One learn best by undoing, making mistakes, uh, learning from the mistakes, and also learning from others. Talk to other leaders how they manage their teams, right? So we were just now previous uh, slide I was sharing. You know, as a design leader, we spend a lot of time in meetings, right? In the corporations, right? There was actually good reasons for it. The reason why I spend a lot of time in meetings, a couple of things. In the leadership role, you'll, you'll be spending time first with your team, right? What it means by spending time with your team means you're managing. Managing meanings guiding them, coaching them, talking to them, trying to understand what's the blockers that they're facing, what's the difficulties that they have in their projects, and trying to help them to unblock, right? That's one thing. You are spending time in meetings because you want to set up a structure for the people that they are able to work in. Third thing, right? Process, right? Setting up processes so that your people, your team, or your stakeholders knows what to do. Setting up process, people know what to look for, what is the next steps. And fourth thing, the most boring of all, operation stuff, day in, day out, approve the budget, etc., right? Which is I hate. So operation things takes up a lot of your time, and you might need to talk to other stakeholders to talk about operational uh, stuff, right? And the last. Uh, point, stakeholders, the most important point of all, you'll be spending a lot of time with stakeholders, right? Understanding what's working for them, what's not working uh, for them, right? And the worst news is that you might not succeed. It's the most alarming fact is despite all this, you might not succeed because what got you successful as a designer might not mean you will be successful as a design leader in a corporation and that is the truth. And it can be emotionally draining, right? Because the biggest difference between a designer and a design lead is you spend a lot of time with people who are not in your tribe. You're spending time with business folks. You're spending time with accountants, finance, with customer service, etc. right? So you're spending more time with people who don't speak like you, who think differently like you, and you have to learn how to speak to them. It's a new, new skill set that, as a designer, you need to pick up. So it's not, all, it's not all bad news, right? So change in a corporation, in an enterprise, does take time. Um, it's not easy. It takes a long while. 
Um, assuming that you have uh, executive buy-in, it can take about three to five years, and you start to see a bit of sign of change, right? And the good news for change uh, is that designing change is no different from the problem that you have been solving all along. And for change to be effective, we start with the most obvious one, which I already mentioned, executive uh, buy-in. Right, this is extremely important because without executive buy-in, design can't grow. And also because you need someone who has your back when things, when things go wrong, right? So even with executive uh, buy-in, it really takes a while to see uh, results. And there are many, many reasons why it takes a long while. And let me share with you some of the key reasons. Resistant. No brainers for this, right? Human beings are habits of creatures. We are naturally resistant to change. People have been working in this company for 10, 15 years, longer than you, and they're really used to a way of working. You coming in trying to demand, hey, let's run a design workshop, let's do this, let's do that. It makes them uncomfortable, right? Second thing, clarity, lack of clarity. So sometimes, to be honest, if people isn't clear of the change that is required to make, how can they change, right? Yeah. And that brings to the last point. A lot of times when change happens, there is definitely a lack of shared understanding of how to reach the goal, right? And there is a lack of shared understanding about the process, the tools, the problems that you want to solve together, the opportunities that you might have together as a team, right? And the best way to solve this kind of issue sometimes is really about this, all right? Change is about people. It's about you, it's about me, it's about the other party and organizations are essentially made of people and imagine that you amplify that discomfort that resistance to a hundred or zillion times that is change at an enterprise level right so in order to overcome change the first thing to do is speak to the heart speak to the mind i would say heart first right um since change is actually a design problem Right? Like all good designers that you and I are, the first thing to do is really to go and talk to the user. Right? Reach out to their hearts, reach out to their mind. That's what I did. Go, I call it go on the tour. When you just join a new enterprise, you join a new company, you know they have not done uh, design before or not in the way that you, you think it is. Go on the tour. Right? This is an opportunity for you to listen to them. Not an opportunity for you to tell them what to do. Don't do that, please. So it's an opportunity for them to listen to them. And the good news now, at least compared to 10 years ago, is a lot of the business folks have actually heard of UX or user experience, right? The bad news is, right, at least based on my own experience, a lot of them still feel that a thing of um, design is all this thing. The shiny objects, the beautiful logos, the beautiful uh, uh, interface icons, and unfortunately, this is not the design that we are talking about here today. It's not that beautiful logo, it's not that good looking object, neither is it that beautiful uh, interface that your team comes up with, right? So a lot of times when you're in enterprise, you will still find people lack a true understanding of what design is and what it can truly deliver, right? And at this point in time, I urge you, don't be in a hurry to change people's perception. Don't. Like a good researcher, start with a listening ear. Take your time to understand the landscape. Right. So I continue with the tour, right? So you reach out to the stakeholders, talk to them, uh, bring out a listening ear, understand the st uh, stakeholders' landscaping, and the question that you can ask really depends because each company is very different, right? It can be different from company to company, culture to culture, but generally my advice is you can start with some of the basic questions. Okay, right. So you can start with the basic questions. Understand their role, who they are, what is their role, especially in the product design and development uh, cycle, right? How do they contribute to the process, right? What is their role in the process, right? And the how. How is the current way of working? How are products being designed and developed? How do they work with uh, product designers, developers, right? And how was product and design feedback being given? How was requirements gathered, right? And what has been working well with them, for them? What hasn't been working well? For them, right? And the what is actually what is important to them, um, what is acceptable to them, 
All right? So these are the things that might take a while for you to discover. Right? It takes time, but I think it's important to bear in mind uh, some of the nuances uh, in uh, enterprise. And the last one and the most important one is that ask them how you can help, how you can contribute and solve their problem. All right. And this brings me to the next point. By talking to them, you will give, have a rough sense of the company's culture, the problems that they are facing, right? Their mindset, their design maturity are level. And there's a famous saying that says, culture eats strategy for breakfast, and we add on, it actually eats design and technology, respectively, for uh, uh, lunch and uh, uh, dinner, right? And you might ask, uh, what is culture? Culture basically is a set of values that guides your behavior and guides their behavior. And it is important because, and I usually talk about culture, it is important and I'd like to give the example of Disney theme park. It's probably the happiest place uh, on earth, right? And one of the famous case study um, I like to share is that there is a group of tourists that uh, check in to the Disney uh, Resort Hotel, right? And they hop onto the bus and the bus driver asks them, hey, How's your day? And um, how's the room, right? And one of the customers responded and say, hey, everything is great except that the tap is not working. And I have not um, let the front desk uh, know about it. And the bus drivers reply, hey, don't worry, mate. Um, uh, we'll get it fixed. So when they come back, <clears throat> the tap was fixed, right? How awesome is that, right? I think the important story here is that the bus driver, right? The bus driver has been trained. The bus driver has been trained that his job is, is not to drive a bus. His job is actually experience, right? To deliver great experiences to the customers. And this is what culture is uh, all about. So can you imagine this happening at other places where people take responsibility beyond what we expected of them? This is culture. Right, and the same thing for design. Design is a culture because design is a behavioral outcome. Design is not a department. Design is not a discipline, to be honest. Right, if you're a designer, you live and breathe design, right? So, in your team, do your team members themselves see themselves as change agent, right? Are they obsessed with uh, customers? Do they actually un understand customer first before they design, or they design first and validate their design with customer? What do your team do, and what do you do? How do you do your design, right? And most important of all, is your team aligned with you in understanding what UX is? And the most hard question is, what does UX look like in the organization? Because in order for UX to be successful in an organization, everyone needs to have a true understanding of its meaning in the organization, right? <coughs> and moving to that, <coughs> moving to that to the true meaning of uh, UX, if you Google UX, you're probably going to see this Venn diagram, right? You're going to see this where UX is in the center of everything, really, everything, all right? And I myself have my own share of experience of drawing Venn diagrams with UX in the center of everything. So if I blow out one of the examples, so I have two examples here. Usually it, 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 it will always fall between these two. So you have, I'm sure some of you have the slides later on, so if I make you uncomfortable, um, please keep an open mind. Um, you have design as one, uh, you have business as one, you have um, business, technology, design as one, UX in the center. Another version that's very commonly used, you have business as one, tech as one, user as one, UX in the center. We are in the center of everything because we are UX designers, right? And we take a look at this one, which is quite interesting. Business case at the outer layer, look and feel at the outer layer, functionality at the outer layer, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to mean that it's less important because UX is in the center. I find this kind of diagrams very limiting because where are the customers? It, it doesn't show the purpose of doing UX. If we recall what we, what we had just now, right? What, we, what I shared just now. I find it limiting and also because it's also one of the greatest lie that we've been told to believe in, that UX is in the center of everything. It projects the impression that UX owns the experience, right? 
but don't give your team that illusion because you don't own the experience, neither do the department own the experience. Design is an outcome driven by decisions made by multiple parties. If any of you guys have worked in enterprise or even in agency, you know this is the truth. And as a designer, I used to believe this. I used to believe that I, as a designer, I own the experience. I have fought tooth and nails to defend my design. All right. And the reality is, most of the time, I fail. If we look back in what we, what we learned just now, actually, customers or human is in the center, right? The products that they're using, be it a machine, be it a hardware, be it a software, is the product they've been using, which is the human is subjected to operation and management, things like policy, labor policy, regulation policies, and also the environment and the context they are subjected to. Is it, like I said earlier on, is it outdoor, indoor, right? Is it a mobile phone or is it a big machinery, etc. right? This might make sense as a diagram for US rather than what we have been subjected to believe in. And where does it lead us to? If we know US is made up of multiple factors, multiple disciplines, the answer is with teamwork. Because we have to play the teamwork game. And teamwork kills silos, right? Teamwork brings and influences people because you guys are working together. That is the best time when you get to talk and influence decisions at a team level, right? Same, so for a design leader, the same thing that, that you need to do. Right. If I look at it from a leadership point of view, a lot of times these are the departments that are being represented in a boardroom level. You have marketing, you have customer uh, analytics, you have operations all being represented at the leadership uh, level. The same thing goes down to your level as well. A lot of times you have projects that will have representatives across various functions. All right. Talk to these functions, right? understand the problems that they are facing, this, what are the customer problems they are trying to uh, uh, solve, right? What is the impact that your design has made on them? For example, customer service, for example, ops, right? Get that alignment, get that shared understanding. And as a team, bring your team closer to the customers, right? Bring your teams to the customer. Bring product managers, bring your de developers, right? Bring your business owner to customer, right? Get your team to listen to the customers help to build empathy and discover, discover customers' insights uh, together, right? And when you do that, don't work in isolation, right? With customers' data, findings, insights, bring your team into co-creation process. For example, customer service officer, they probably know the products better than you and me because they talk to customers every single day to solve a problem, to solve a ticket. Business development, they probably know the products and the customers better than you and me because customers will give them feedback every day about what's missing or what's not working. Bring them to your co-creation process and work together to solve a problem together. And working together helps to unblock a couple of things, which is the three blockers that I mentioned early on. Resistance. By working together, you build team spirit. Right? By working together, you have a common goal. Right? Clarity. When you work together, you know what problem you're trying to solve, right? You have a common goal again, you have clarity, and because constantly there will be communication between all the various departments. Shared understanding. Again, when you work together, you understand what's their pain, what's your pain. You're working together to overcome uh, blockers uh, together. That is the power of teamwork. Next point. So, teamwork with the external uh, stakeholders. What about your internal team? Build a team that actually solve problems. Not, don't build a team that just push pistols, right? And the reason is because when you're put in charge to set up a team, to lead a team, basically your boss expects you to get shit done. Pardon my language. Get shit done basically means solve a customer's problem. Deliver something, right? Deliver something that is valuable to the customers. And a lot of times, Many of the designers that, that I met are still very much focused on making things look good. And pretty often, I saw it on their resumes. I start to see this. Okay, I, 
you know, I can do this, I can, do, I can run design thinking workshop, I can run research, I, I, can, I, know, I, I know I can do Scrum, etc. fine. This might be important as a designer perspective, but in the bigger scheme of things, I already shared, these are not the things that will make great products nor experiences. And it doesn't help because this can be problematic as this action can reinforce your stakeholders' impression of design as pretty things or design without actionable outcomes. And to be honest, if it is unclear as to what you do and why it's important, it's very difficult to engage people. It's very difficult to engage your stakeholders why they should spend time with you on doing some of the activities here, right? So build a team, right, that asks good questions. Build a team that builds answers. Don't build a team that has answers. Build a team that thinks critically, right? Because end of the day, we are here to solve a problem. And, to, and as a design lead or a design leader, it's really important that we start asking better questions, help our team to ask better questions, and emphasize the, emphasize the need to ask good questions and move and do things beyond the surfaces. I will give a quick um, example, All right, um, using Grab as an example. So back when I was with Grab, the team knew that one of the problems that we have is that customers tend to use Grab Pay when there is a promotion. Right? When there is a promotion code, then they switch their payment method to Grab Pay. Right? When there's no promotion, they switch back to paying cash or paying uh, credit or debit cards. Right? And this is not ideal because one of the first questions that we have is that, how can we help customers to make better pricing decisions? Right? We understood the motivation behind using our promo codes is to save money. But how can we help them to make that decision when, when they have up their uh, mobile phone at the moment of booking, they can make that decision better without going through their email of the notification uh, in Grab Apps uh, uh, inbox to find that uh, promo codes. Right? First problem to solve, how can we help them to build how can we help them to make better pricing decisions? Right? From a business uh, uh, and product perspective, we want to increase the stickiness of our product, right? which is in this case, uh, grab pay as a payment uh, met, uh, method. And also from a business perspective, it is actually very costly to run promo codes. Right? We have minions behind it to generate uh, promo codes. And also it is costly because it's very costly to handle cash. Right? Ha handling cash actually has a cost. Right? So, some of the questions that we have is how can, and oh, I forgot, um, third reason why it's not good because using promo codes we encourages customers' bargain, bargain hunting mindset. It's not something that we want, right? We don't want to encourage this kind of uh, uh, mindset, right? So, with this in mind, right, we have our first iterations, right? This is the first uh, iterations. It doesn't work very well, right? Um, because some of the most important part was actually not obvious, right? I'm not sure if you guys can see, probably not, but the uh, paying by grab pay, you, can, you are paying, let's say, for another 4,000 uh, uh, RP if you pay by grab pay. Based on the research that we did with customer, or usability tests that we did with customers, a lot of customers, customers miss, miss out, right? They continue to pay by cash, they continue to pay by uh, 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 debit or, or credit card, right? So we found out, okay, doesn't work. Next iteration. So we create one that is a little bit more obvious, right? This works well. Uh, how does it work well? It works well because first, it allows customer to compare quickly without figuring out, without looking for something, right? Once you book, it actually tells you, if you pay by grab pay, is this amount, you pay by cash tuna in, in Indonesian means cash, uh, you pay by this, uh, this amount. It allows customer to make decision quickly, right? And it gives controls back to the customer. The problem with this is that actually it takes too many clicks to book. And to be honest, the interactions uh, design flow is a little bit clumsy because when you click on book, then we have this uh, uh, bottom drawer coming up and says, choose your payment method, do you want to save more money? So it doesn't work very well uh, from our perspective. Right? Then we have the final uh, design, which increase our, our MAU by 30%. How does it, why does it work? The first question is, First thing, it actually combines what we learn. First thing is that it allows customers to quickly compare the pricing. It helps customers to make a decision fast. They don't need to think. They just need to look. And it was obvious what can save, how, how much money they can save. So these two things, right? And when we launch it, what we learn uh, from uh, post-launch is that this design actually 
helps, helps and is more effective than promo codes because the per dollar quantum is more effective. And in a way, it helps to reduce the bargain hunting mindset. Customers stop looking for promo codes. Straight away, you can tell, you, the customer can decide which options and how they want to pay. And why this is actually important and a great slide or a great story to tell in the enterprise level is because it achieved a couple of things. First thing, it demonstrates to the management, the business, and non designers is that iterations and continuous learning helps to improve the design, which is why we need to run user testing early instead of when we build it, right? Second thing uh, is that it helps customers to make uh, decisions uh, better, right? It helps customers to improve their decision making process, it reduces uh, the clicks as well. Right. And at the same time, it also aligns the design with the business goal, right? with the business outcome, as well as balancing the customer's goal. So it helps to illustrate, this, this story helps to illustrate to the business that, hey, design actually has a value and it can deliver value to the business. And this is something that is super critical in the business organization or on the enterprise level. Right? We do need to demonstrate the value of design with numbers. All right, which brings me to my next point. Because simply, and on the enterprise level, and I think it doesn't matter if it's even enterprise level, in all things that we do, if you can't manage, you can't measure it, right? And measuring results is one of the most effective ways to show design values and its impact. And to wrap it up, uh, to wrap it up the session, the road to change is actually both slow and fast. Slow because ultimately we are talking about behavioral change and it takes time for people to change their behavior. Fast because if you're a design leader, you do need to show result in order to gain trust and confidence, right? You can't wait for one year to see results. So my advice to design leaders or to be design leaders is that start with the small wins because small wins is going to lead you to bigger wins in the future, right? And Second thing is that designing change in enterprise, as I mentioned, is actually about designing behavior. And it's about behavioral change. And behavioral change is ultimately about the people that you hire, the people that you work with, and to enable change is really about setting first a clear direction for them to uh, move towards to, setting up a clear and favorable condition and environment for them to success, for success, to enable success, right? And with this, right, I'd like to thank everyone. For those who are in the transformation uh, journey, I wish you the best, right? Um, it's a long and hard journey, so stay strong, stay healthy, right? And good luck to your uh, transformation journey. All right, thank you. Question? Okay. Question. Yeah. Thanks so much, Yonghua. Thank you. Okay, we just have a few questions, so... Let's see, what big design things, principles, or habits did you have to unlearn when you became a design leader, if any? So can you repeat that again? Uh, what big design, big design. Mm. things, principles, mm. and habits did you mm. have to unlearn when you became a design leader? Um, first thing is not to design. <laughs> I see that uh, uh, in my slides as well. I think the first thing to prevent yourself or to do is really not to do the actual design because as I say, as a design leader, one of the uh, key differences is that the design is done by your team, right? The design is done by others. So you are supposed to help the others to design by unblocking blockers that is standing in their way. It could be a project issue, it could be a business issue, right? Or to guide them, to coach them, to ask better questions. So I think the first thing is not to design. I also add to it, which I observe, and my myself is guilty of it is, I tell people how to design without designing it during design critic session. Um, I think that's a bad habit, which I'm also trying to change. Yeah. So don't tell people how to design. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And why must we be a design leader to move forward? Why not subject matter oh. experts? Um, no, no. Um, one thing for sure, you don't need to be a design leader to move forward depending on your organizations, right? In my organization, there are two career tracks. So we call it dual career tracks. You can be an uh, individual contributor. That means you can, for example, you can be a VP uh, as a designer, 
right? The difference between that is that you can be a VP as a design lead. The difference is that as a design lead, you have a team. So you might spend uh, your time, look at the differences, right? As an individual uh, contributor, 100% of your time is working on projects. As a design lead, you might be spending 70 or 60% of your time on project and then 40% or 30% of the time coaching your team. Of course, if you're head of design, it's a completely different thing uh, uh, altogether. Yeah. So, no, you don't need to be a manager or a lead in order to progress in your career, but ultimately, it very much depends on your organization that you're in. Yeah. Thanks. This one's kind of long. Oh, okay. Okay. My company hired non-UX people to be customer experience team, and they always act like they are UX <laughs> and messed, messed up design, our design work. Our I team, feel your pain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> our team always has to fix their work. What can we do? Mm. It is long and it is tough. Um, to be honest, um, it's not a simple... In, there might not be a simple solution because it actually went a few uh, level ups. It's about organization's level. It's about uh, management level, how they structure their team, and if there is a representative uh, in the boardroom right, to talk about, hey, how are we going to shape design? How are we going to governance design? And which departments focus on what? So I know there are organizations where you, well, you have experience, customer experience team, which end of the day might be process guy. We call it um, people with black belt. I'm not sure, maybe some of you guys are in such an organization, right? And they might be driving different things. They might be driving customer journey mapping and then telling people what to do. So I don't have an answer. Uh, I'm, I'll be very honest. I don't have an answer. It actually rests on the design leadership uh, at that uh, level, right? So that is one. And second thing, um, just without knowing the context, because I don't think I'm in the positions to give solution without knowing the context, right? So I think it's important to think about, talk to your managers to understand, hey, how can you guys work together better? And how can you come to an agreement on the roles and the responsibilities? I think that kind of hard conversations needs to be discussed at, at least from a leads level and a, a management uh, uh, level. If you want to talk about it at project level, perhaps, but I think it's important to have that conversation, have a clear line of uh, roles and responsibilities, because I think that was one of the reasons why it, it, it happened. There's no clear roles and responsibility. Yep. Okay. Yay. Thank you, Young. Thank you. And we'll also be collecting your questions. So even if we don't get to it, you know, it'll be there. Yes. Cool. And now we'd like to give you a token oh, of our okay. appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Like it, yeah. <laughs> oh, of course I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. 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 Thank you.